Ethics is the philosophical study of correct and incorrect, right and wrong decisions. And it's one of the most contested parts of philosophy, partly because we bring so many assumptions to the table whenever we do ethics. And ethics is in fact something we do. It's a practice that we engage with in order to better understand the way that we make decisions. Typically, as ethics has historically been done, it has been seen as something that is getting at objective truth values of moral claims. For example, you ought to do X, Y, or Z. And ethics has been typically seen as concerning the truth value of moral claims. But there is a different kind of ethics, which is a more comparative approach and a more neutral approach, which is descriptive ethics. Instead of commanding us in the form of normative claims of things that we ought to do, descriptive ethics is a sort of meta-ethical approach where we look at the practice of ethics as describing things about human behavior instead of commanding them. Now, this doesn't mean we can't use moral claims to command each other to act such and such a way. But descriptive ethics reframes the way that we look at the practice of doing ethics and ultimately its goal in order to have a more cosmopolitan, neutral, and collaborative approach to ethics. <music> ethics is rife with moral dilemmas. You have a choice between two things, and the job is partly to look at the initial response that the person makes to the situation, and also to present a response that one ought to do. Take, for example, two people drowning in a lake. One is a stranger, one is your brother. Most people would probably save, if they could only choose one, they would save their brother. And, of course, the question in ethical reasoning, and part of the process of ethical reasoning, is looking at the assumptions that go behind our behaviors. And this leads principally to things that we value. We value family. We value coherence of action. We value transparency of our character. We value character. We value rationality. We value freedom. We value conformity. All of these different things fit into our actions such that it's very clear in this case that the reason that one would choose their brother over a stranger is because all things are not equal between these two people. The fact is that even if we would like to assume that we can approach ethics from a neutral perspective, in fact, we do not. We come with presuppositions about what kinds of things we value. And this brings us to one of the ways that descriptive ethics works. Descriptive ethics looks at different situations and it tells us the implicit in our moral decisions are values. There can also be feelings or desires. And different philosophers are going to accentuate different parts of this to varying extents. For example, you have David Hume. And David Hume is famous for talking about not moral claims or moral truths, but moral feelings. For Hume, moral claims are ultimately an attempt to volley our feelings to others and make them go along with those feelings, act in concordance with those feelings, buttress those feelings. So for example, if I feel that my personal well-being is of tremendous importance, which to most people, their own well-being is rather important. If you doubt this, put your hand on a hot stove or sit at the toilet and throw up and think about how much you value your own well-being when it comes down to it. 
For Hume, in ethics, I'm taking these assumptions about the feelings I have, the affects that approach me, and I'm trying to put those onto others. And I'm trying to create systems where I can justify those feelings. And one of the ways that Hume tries to talk about ethics is the famous is-ought distinction. For Hume, what we have in the world is a number of states of affairs, ways in which things are. I am sat in this chair. I am thinking about ethics. Other people are driving, whatever, whatever the state of affairs may be. But there are simply states of affairs, and there are things which are happening. Those would be is statements, saying ways the world is. Now, ought statements compel us to think about ways the world should be or ought to be. Now, Hume says that all ought statements are actually is statements insofar as they reflect the inner feelings or desires of the person making the statement. So, for example, when I say, you should go get me a glass of water, what I'm actually trying to do is convince someone else to abide by my feelings. And that actually, ought statements are is statements about the person making the statement. And in fact, ought statements as ought statements don't even make any sense. Because if we're trying to think of ought statements as ways in which the world should be, well, for Hume, the world is, and it will continue to be in a number of different states of affairs. But to talk of it as moving to some state of affair, insofar as this is seen to be something abstracted from states of affairs, something we can, you know, freely choose, something that we can decide, you know, I'm going to act in this way because I think the world ought to be this way. Well, Hume is going to say, the world is going to be certain ways, whether you like it or not. And you, in fact, are just a part among this world, and you are bred with feelings and desires, which you don't control what feelings or desires you receive. You simply have a, you know, a, a way of existing in the world that comes along with certain feelings. And as a result, for Hume, when we're talking about ethics, we are merely describing states of affairs. And even when we are talking about ought statements, what we should really be doing is looking at the ways in which those ought statements are actually reflections of states of affairs of people's feelings. So that's one approach to descriptive ethics. Another one is Nietzsche. And when Nietzsche thinks about ethics, for him, it is about the contestation of power, and it is the negotiation of power. So when we're looking at ethics, we see a number of different agents acting in certain ways, and certain ones have more power or authority or more perceived authority than others. And for Nietzsche, ethics is about either succumbing to the sort of background way of existing, which would be the sort of herd morality or the slave morality. This would be being subservient to the normative claims of those in power. Whereas the master morality would be the one who is deciding the moral claims, the one who is deciding how things ought to be. So for Nietzsche, when he looks at morality, he sees a bunch of people with different levels of power trying to negotiate with other people to act on the, you know, the power instantiator's behalf. So we've got Hume talking about ethics describing feelings, Nietzsche ethics describing power. You also have Deleuze and Guattari who say that ethics is concerning desire. It's pretty similar to Hume, right? Hume is saying that actually when I'm talking about ought statements, really I am just saying feelings that I have inside me. For Deleuze and Guattari, 
I am doing the same with desire. There are certain desires I have which are tied up in a relation, you know, a relational network of power, so very, very connected to nature, such that I am trying to volley my desires onto other, and, I, and I'm trying to convince other people what to desire. So it's not just how people should act, but how, sh how people should comport themselves, how people should desire certain states of affairs, you know, sort of micromanaging this political sphere. So, of course, ethics is necessarily political because, you know, you've got ethics talking about, or at least what we would like to think, is the truth value of moral claims and the negotiation of feelings, power, desire. You've got politics over here, which is concerned with power and the negotiation of power. And these two are interlinked for Nietzsche, for Baudrillard, for Deleuze, Guattari, for Foucault, all these different people. And then finally, not as well known of a philosophical figure, but Michael Sandel, a living philosopher who teaches at Harvard, has a great book on ethics, which I've used as the inspiration for my Intro to Ethics series. And he talks about the fact that, in fact, ethics is a way of contesting our values. It is a way of both describing what these values are and trying to create systems which convince other people to value different things than they do. So, for example, I talked in the pawn situation about, well, we desire family, and that's why we might choose the brother over the random person. Um, also, if this was a random person or a dog, we would probably choose the random person because we value human well-being more so than the well-being of other animals. And there's, for example, evolutionary reasons for that and sociological reasons. Um, and that's an important element of this descriptive approach to ethics is that it does kind of come together with sociology. We're not so much talking about ethics as if it refers to some metaphysical truth of these ought statements, which are objectively true and binding. No, instead, it tells us ways in which human affairs take place, how we negotiate and contest these affairs. So there are basically two aspects to descriptive ethics. There is simply describing states of affairs and not, not describing the objectivity of moral claims, but more particularly the moral claimant, the one making the claim. And then second, the contestation or the sort of, you know, the bureaucratic management of these claims, trying to create systems which ground ethics in, for example, individual freedom if you're talking about libertarian ethics, or rational cost-benefit analysis, if you're talking about utilitarian ethics, or virtue and duty, if you're talking about, you know, virtue ethics or duty ethics. All of these different, I mean, it, even take divine command theory, right, that you're supposed to do what God has commanded is predicated upon the idea that one ought to value what a deity has to say, and that that is of tremendous importance for oneself, ultimately, to go back to that point. All of these are grounded in different values, different things we desire, different things we feel, and different states of power in the world. All of these kind of come together, such that a descriptive ethical approach is going to give us a number of benefits which is that it allows us to compare ethical systems and see little nuggets of truth in all of them. For example, libertarian ethics is really nice because it tries to remove as much as possible value judgments concerning ethical actions. So for example, if I'm in my own house, a libertarian would say, I can be as naked as I want. No one can do anything about it because I'm not harming or hindering the freedom of anyone else. And that freedom is kind of the, that's the sole limiting factor on actions. So for example, libertarian ethics is very open. Uh, it's relatively neutral in that regard. Utilitarian ethics is very rationalistic. It can be kind of detached. 
uh, it can be very quantitative. So for example, this fits into societies that use markets and use different, you know, determining factors in markets to determine whether or not a decision will be beneficial according to whether or not it will turn a profit, right? So all of these different approaches not only have their own nuggets of truth, but they have their people and societies which they tend to jive with best. So a descriptive ethical approach is going to better allow us to see these nuggets of truth in different ethical systems and bring them into dialogue, into a dialectic where we can synthesize them without necessarily resolving them. That's the important thing. We're not necessarily, in fact, we're not trying to reach a, this is what you ought to do. Descriptive ethics is more about telling us the kinds of things we do value, the limitations of each of those value structures, and how we can kind of try to negotiate these with each other. So that being said, I hope this has been somewhat helpful in terms of understanding this ethical approach. I think it's very helpful and exciting, and I think it's the last leg of ethics, to be frank. Um, I think the the kind of traditional normative approach to ethics is just completely vapid to me. Um, check out any of my other lectures I've done on postmodernism, German idealism, gender theory, postcolonial studies, and other literature. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a private philosophy Zoom, which you can tailor to your needs. I also have super thanks available if you want to just donate to the channel because books are not cheap. I also have a Heidegger Being in Time reading group that is currently going on. If you want to join, you can see the um, kind of reading schedule and whatnot on my channel and hopefully take part. Or if you're seeing this way in the future, I will have had lectures out already on the reading so you can still join. That's it for this lecture and I'll see you in another one.